how are the shelters run now compared to uh, 10 years ago in terms of being you know, safe and, and healthy? And you know, in terms of just the day-to-day -day management, is there something for the next mayor to do? Because I think something else for us to, to deal with is uh, if shelters were set up to be a temporary resource, and the trends you're talking about, real wages going down, rents going up, that's not a temporary problem. So is there a fundamental mismatch between you know, that resource that we've created and that we're all very proud of and the problem that we're trying to solve? I think New York City is fortunate to have this fundamental protection for homeless people, the legal right to shelter, which is the reason we haven't seen kids and families uh, sleeping in cars or in tent cities. It's the reason we, uh, we have uh, a relatively smaller percentage of our homeless population sleeping on the streets, although still far too many people sleeping on the streets and in unsheltered uh, situations. Um, having said that, there are still real problems with uh, making that, that right a reality for many families. Um, you know, the city continues to make it very difficult for many homeless families to obtain shelter. Uh, it wrongfully denies shelter to many families who are genuinely homeless and have no other place to stay and yet go to seek shelter uh, at the city's intake center in the Bronx uh, and at the intake center for, for childless families in Manhattan. Uh, so there continue to be real management problems there. We've actually seen that sort of rate of uh, turnaways uh, increasing in recent years. Uh, so that really speaks to, I think, then a real sort of philosophical issue about how are we, there's a right way and a wrong way to reduce homelessness. We know the right ways, and we'll talk a little bit about more, more about this when we talk about what the next mayor can do. But you know, there's, we've learned so much over the last 30 years. There's a virtual consensus among academic experts, among policy experts, among frontline service providers, among advocates about what works affordable housing for homeless families, permanent supportive housing for individuals and families living with special needs. These are things that really work. The wrong way is to close the door on people who are in need, uh, to turn people away who are seeking help. Those are things that don't really work. So having said that, um, you know, certainly the nonprofit community has done so much in the last uh, you know, the last decades to really transform the shelter system, certainly uh, the, the sort of the old uh, you know, three hots in a cot model that we saw in the 80s is really is gone. We now have experienced not-for-profit service providers doing amazing work every day. But there continue to be real problems. Um, uh, with all due respect to my colleagues from the Department of Homeless Services here, some of the shelters directly operated by the city continue to be subpar and could have much more in the way of better conditions and services. And there's a host of for-profit shelter operators, including people operating commercial hotels and motels, where the conditions and the services continue to be much less than they should be. And the city, unfortunately, as the numbers of homeless people and shelters has increased so dramatically uh, over the last decade, uh, has turned more and more to for-profit shelters. Uh, providers. And then finally, I would just say there's a very controversial model of shelter where the city that began under the Giuliani administration but was unfortunately expanded very dramatically under, uh, under the current administration where the city uses apartment buildings, uses permanent housing resources as temporary shelter. Uh, the scatter site, cluster site shelter model, a very controversial model of shelter that in many ways really points to the fundamental kind of, uh, I think what you could call lunacy of the way the city approaches the problem of homelessness, where we're spending $37,000 a year to shelter a family, $28,000 a year to shelter a single individual, uh, paying some landlords of these apartment buildings, you know, more than $3,000 a month for these apartments, when we could be providing permanent housing resources, rental assistance, the kinds of things that would keep people in permanent housing uh, for a fraction of that cost. Uh, $10,000 a year is about the cost of a Section 8 voucher, um, and yet we're spending $38,000 a year to shelter a family. And that mismatch is really at the heart of the, the policy quandary that the next mayor is going to have to confront. So DHS spends about a billion dollars, a little bit under a billion dollars a year. And if you look at the DHS portfolio, the vast amount of that money goes to supporting shelter. And so I think, from my perspective, the, the issue is that we are skewing our response to homelessness in New York City towards shelter. When in fact, what we'd like to be able to do, and we do to a large extent, but not nearly enough, is direct folks into permanent housing. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the shelter system has become the lowest threshold denominator housing in New York City. 
a family gets a unit that is an apartment. This is not, I mean, you guys know this because you do this. When I speak in other parts of the country, they, they don't quite grasp this, but you get what is in essence an apartment. And families now, the average length of stay is about 12 months. And that means, that if that's the mean, there are people who are there much longer. So what the, one of the problems we're facing is that we've created this strong, well-managed, clean, safe shelter system, and it's almost become housing. And that's a distortion. We should be directing people into housing, and people shouldn't be remaining for long periods of time in shelter. It's not, if, if this were easy, we would have solved it already, right? So it's not easy. And, you know, I, I'm, and I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody saying, well, you know, the cost of shelter for a family for a month is $3,000, and the cost of housing for uh, that same family for a month is $1,000, and housing is a better outcome, and it's cheaper, so we should just put all people in housing. But unfortunately, it's more complicated than that, right? We have an average length of stay of, in the family shelter system in New York City of about 12 months. So that's a $36,000 cost per family of keeping that family in shelter. Most of the proposals, including from people in this room, are to provide a long-term rental assist or a moderate to long-term rental assistance package for that family of five years. So it, it, we're already talking, uh, it, when you look at the cost per night, of course shelter is more expensive, housing is a better outcome and less expensive, but the long term, when you take the time factor in consideration, if we were to simply house everybody who walked through the intake center at PATH, we would have a system that was much more expensive than it is now. So the, the dilemma that DHS has all the time is how do we craft a rental assistance program that's going to be effective and uh, get to the people who are in most need? I mean, there, there is a limited resource. It is not an unlimited resource. And so there's got to be these Solomon-like decisions that DHS and folks have to make to figure out who goes down the pathway of housing. So it, it's not simply, I, I wish it were, it would be solvable if that was the case. It would be solvable tomorrow if that was the case. It would just be a money issue. But it is not simply a matter of let's take everybody in shelter and move them into housing. We have a more complicated problem. We've created a proto-housing system in our shelter system, and that's what I think we need to move away from and return shelter to its core mission of being an emergency response to a family or an individual in a housing crisis. Okay. We do have a system that is uh, unfortunately under-resourced to do the task that it is task, the task at hand. So we have a length of stay going up. We have some opportunity there um, to, while they're in the shelter system to see what we can do to work on their skill set. That should not be just the obligation of the city agency that's homeless services. It should be the obligation of the city across the board around providing other kinds of resources to them outside of DHS. So I think, you know, what I want to talk about, um, the shelter system is not the panacea. It's not the solution. It's part of the solution, but it's not the solution. And I think that we've gone off track with that. And one of the things, now the hat that I'm going to switch into is the United to End Homelessness hat, which I'm representing also as uh, part of the coordinating committee. And you have green papers on your chair, and they're also in your packet. One of the, you know, one of the planks in our platform, um, and I'll talk a little bit later, I guess I'll have an opportunity, but one of the planks in our platform is this idea that we need to right-size the shelter system, that we need to make sure there are adequate resources to move people out, but there are also places within the shelter system where there's not enough, like we're not doing enough. If you talk to the runaway homeless uh, youth folks, there's just not enough services or specific services and programs for that population that are very unique, uh, they have very unique special needs that we're not doing enough in New York City. So we're talking about not expanding shelter, we're talking about right sizing, we're talking about moving services around, we're talking about ensuring that there's enough beds for domestic violence survivors, that we look at the system as a whole, not just as DHS or an HRA or an HPD program, but that we look at the whole system, we look at the people coming in, and as I, a lot of folks know, I always say that we need to create a system that is diverse as the reason that people came in. So a diverse system must, must match the diversity of needs and reasons that people present as homeless. And we have not been doing a good job at doing that. And part of that problem, I would say, is that we haven't, you know, we've been dealing with a crisis. We've been in crisis, crisis, crisis mode. And as one of my board members uh, reminded me, they said to me, at what point is it no longer a crisis and it's just status quo? For 30 years, we've had a crisis. 
well, we're no longer calling it a crisis. We're going to move forward. We're going to make some change. And I hope that's sort of where we're going to go with the, mm -hmm. sure. the next question. Absolutely. We've talked about the shelter system, and I want to talk about the permanent housing piece. But let's take a step back and talk about prevention, because that was, on one hand, part of the mayor's plan in 2004. And there were some, I think, earnest efforts with home base to, to accomplish that, to prevent homelessness. And on the other hand, as we've talked about a couple times this morning, um, you know, this is not so much uh, a story or a crisis of people facing individual emergencies. It's part of a larger systemic economic um, mismatch between earnings and housing and, and other things. So beyond the shelter system, perhaps be even, even beyond DHS, are there city policies that could um, either by being improved or being uh, expanded or being removed could help prevent people getting into the system in the first place. Let's not talk about feds or state. We'll assume they're not going to help us at all, just for this uh, question. Is there, is there anything the city can do to prevent people from getting in the system in the first place? So a, a couple of you know, key areas. I mean, I think prevention is key. We have to begin looking at that. Um, as one of the key components of any solution for homelessness in New York City. Uh, before, I mean, as you know, we've talked about how expensive it is to house people in shelter, but we need to be helping people before they come in. So there's a couple components to prevention that I think are important. And, and I, I do want to say that our, um, our state partners do support prevention and eviction and homelessness prevention. So they are, they're, they're key to uh, New York City. So I want to include them in this. I think that home base, the way that home base was designed and the research and the data that went into it was fantastic. They looked at the feeder communities. That was really smart use of data to look at where do we, uh, where do we need to put these centers that get to people before they come in. So I think um, prevention is really, really key. 95% of people um, who go into housing court don't have any uh, legal representation with them. And they usually lose. 95% of landlords go into court and they win. So I think that is one piece that we have to, we have to really make sure that the city maintains their commitment in the next administration around this. DHS has done this. Uh, the state's made a commitment. Or, and we know a lot of private funders are putting money in New York City to ensure that people go into court either with a lawyer or an advocate with them because we know that they have much better outcomes. So one, if we can just get people into the housing court system with some sort of representation, and that's not expensive. And then, you know, just looking at homelessness prevention or eviction prevention, the cost of something like that, it, it really depends on the contracts, and I've talked to a lot of prevention providers, but it's pretty affordable. It's like $3,500 a year to prevent an eviction and to work with people. And they don't just deal with the actual eviction case. They deal with all those other things. So they know how to make the connection for not just the arrears, but they know how to make the connection for, OK, let's get this person into a, a job training program, or let's not ever see them again. Let's get them into a money management program. So I think prevention is absolutely key to that. And I think one piece that people aren't talking about but that's been part of the platform is this idea of aftercare. And aftercare is the idea that people coming out of shelter, they need some uh, supports and resources. And that was the initial idea behind uh, the home base program. And we've had others, you know, state funded and also privately funded programs that really try and help people with that easing of transition leaving shelter. And for folks who have been unstably housed for a number of years, they really do need that kind of support to help them make their way back into the world and somebody to go to when they don't know how to deal with a landlord that may be harassing them or dealing with issues around, uh, you know, con ed or something like that, or just plain money management. So those are those are key. So it's and and those services are very similar and they're not expensive services. But the, and the city has been committed, and we were fortunate uh, during the recession that we got HPRP money and and to increase that money. Um, the problem with that is that uh, across the country, there just hasn't been a, a lot of definitive research of, about how close uh, do you put that intervention um, for prevention. And that's been the hard part, is how close, but for without this money, would you have become homeless? And so how close to the front door of the shelter system do you provide these services? Um, I would venture to say it's worth every dime to have everybody go into, first of all, go into housing court with some sort of representation. Um, and then, you know, making sure that there's adequate resources for them to look at, you know, what got them into that situation. But then I would go into the deeper uh, prevention programs. And I know I spoke with some of our colleagues at DHS that within the next few weeks they're going to be having more research that uh, will be public about their experience and their outcomes uh, providing prevention services. 
And I think that's going to really change the lay of the land, I think not just for New York City, but all over the country. And I'm very eagerly awaiting that information. Um, again, it's not expensive. It's common sense to try and help people once they've been in the shelter system and before they come in to provide these you know, concrete case management services, giving them the, to the tools and the skills they need before they actually come in or after they've been in. Because one of the only indicators for somebody becoming homeless is a previous stay of being homeless. So if we know that and we have you know, complex data systems, if we know that somebody's at risk, why are we not working with them? Let's continue, and hopefully in the next administration, not to just to continue the current uh, commitment, but to expand that because it's so cost affordable and we know the impact is so great. 